sacrifice, defined as to suffer loss of, give up, renounce, injure, or destroy, especially for the, an ideal belief or end. Leaf footballers know this all too well. To become professionals, they need to give up a lot in their lives to make it in a sport and occupation that they love. No parties, have minimal social lives, and heavily restricted lifestyles. Even after they've managed to make it, they still need to continue to put in a lot of work and dedication to maintain or develop even more in their game. Progression isn't linear in football. The athlete can experience poor form, an injury, getting dropped from the squad, or relationships within the club beginning to turn sour. These can begin to negatively affect the athlete, questioning themselves if they're even good enough, which can lead to spiraling mental health, which can manifest into symptoms of anxiety and depression. The player, whether male or female, will seek solutions to try and recover their form, regain their spot in the team, or come back stronger than before from an injury setback. They may take extra training sessions with club or private coaches, stay back after training to analyze match footage of themselves or other elite players, hire a personal trainer to help them get fitter and stronger, and or start to focus on what and how much goes into their body. Getting leaner, faster and stronger sounds like the ideal preparation one can do to get back into the team after being out of it. But maybe it does not have the outcome they want, so they'll try harder. They train harder, work more in the gym and cut even more food out to become the optimal athlete. Despite doing all these things and then some, their performances are still below par. They are suffering small injuries and longer recovery periods and they can't concentrate on the simplest tasks in the day. When we talk about footballers, their performances and character are scrutinized by people on social media as well as coaches. People try to find flaws in them, either in their ability, their commitment levels, or their appearance. This instills fear, with the players asking themselves if they are even good enough. Some players will find help from others, and some will revert to type to return to what they did before. Others, unfortunately, will enter a stage where their mental state has them trapped in a dark place that will cause far more harm than they ever intended, becoming one of the deadliest mental health diseases someone can go through. It can take many forms and has many names, but they all fall under a categorization where the number of cases have only increased in the last few decades. We are talking about eating disorders, particularly in football. It can be described as having an unhealthy attitude towards food. It comes in a variety of different titles depending on the symptoms experienced by the individual. Anorexia nervosa is an ED categorized by an abnormally low body weight, an intense fear of gaining weight, and a distorted perception of weight. Bulimia is heavily restricting food and then eating a massive amount of food, an action known as binging. And orthorexia, an obsession with eating clean or pure foods. Today we're exploring how these types of disorders are becoming more prevalent in elite football. Not all athletes will suffer from a specific type, but it can be argued that some athletes have distorted eating patterns. According to meta-analyses from 2004 and 2013 that focused on elite athletes, ED or disordered eating is shown to be more prevalent compared to non-athletes. While a higher percentage of females suffer with clinical levels of ED than males, both groups are at risk of suffering the negative effects of these symptoms. But how do eating disorders occur in people, particularly in athletes? ED can occur at any age regardless of lifestyle but the seeds are often sown in adolescence. Genetics plays a huge role in people being predisposed to developing one, but it is only considered a risk factor. Others include psychological, emotional, social, and environmental factors, which in accumulation can lead to varying degrees of ED. Many of the most successful players face a lot of adversity and difficulties to make it in their game. Family issues, financial issues, bullying or abuse, insecurities with food or living conditions, and social cultural factors can be deemed traumatic. The key link that these have to ED is the lack of control. Growing up, you can't control the situation you are in. What your family or others do, what people think of you, or what environment you are raised in. With players striving to become professionals, you do not know if you'll get signed by an academy, whether you'll get signed to a pro deal, or if you'll make it in the game. In a world full of stressful situations, the one thing players can control to influence their career is what they eat and with that obsession it can lead to severely negative effects. Athletes are more prone to developing ED because of the environment they are in. As mentioned earlier in the video, their desire to be successful will lead them to find ways to chase perfection. Footballers are highly competitive individuals and will seek any advantage to get better. 
Being in the eye of the public can place huge psychological strain on them, having every single part of their life analysed and critiqued by journalists and members of the public, putting a lot of stress on their mental well-being. So, what are the negative effects for players? To perform at your optimal level, you need to fuel yourself properly. Failing to do so over a prolonged period can have long-lasting consequences on your body. You become fatigued, which can increase the likelihood of injuries, your performances suffer, your reaction time and coordination is impaired, and your judgment decreases. From a health perspective, it causes damage to vital organs, including the heart. Bone density and muscle mass decreases. Cardiovascular and gastrointestinal complications occur. Infertility issues and the loss of the menstrual cycle in women occurs. Tooth decay, gum disease, hair loss can happen. And an increased risk of heart failure. All these factors will cause performances to diminish, which will further increase symptoms of anxiety and depression, which then furthers the chokehold that ED has until it becomes too much for the body or the mind. What needs to be done at football clubs? To start, we look at the athlete and mid-disordered eating. Getting treatment as soon as possible is key. Therapy through associations and licensed counsellors is the correct course of action. Many of the elite clubs have dedicated psychologists that work with the players who can help the players through their recovery journey, whether in-house or finding other people to do so. For many, that may mean taking a break from the sport they love and they make their living from, but pausing your career for a time is better than being forced to stop completely. Football clubs can play a massive role in the fight against eating disorders. They can seek and provide education for staff, coaches and players around the prevention and recognition of eating disorders. As mentioned earlier, female athletes are more susceptible to ED, so this would be especially useful in the women's game. Educate the players around the importance of nutrition in a way that does not demonize food, but instead enlightens them around balance and performance. Foster and maintain a culture for players where they can go to staff to disclose any concerns they may have and use their newfound knowledge to find solutions for the athlete and to seek treatment if necessary. Lastly, to be careful of the language and how you treat players. Stories about fat camps have circulated in football, with players from various clubs mentioning how their weight was measured frequently and were expected to stay in a small range. This can be triggering for some people. Potentially reducing these instances or removing weight goals entirely would be a solution in this regard. As human beings, we are unique. We all look, sound, act, and do things differently. This also relates to genetics and our bodies. When we look at athletes, some are naturally broader and stronger, others are leaner and slighter, and many others in between. Players of both genders also have their own optimal body composition, and as people, we hold muscle and fat more in certain places than others. While two people who are the same weight and height as each other, their bodies can be vastly different in how they look beside one another. To prevent the chances of disordered eating occurring with players in a squad, there are several methods and habits that can be instilled. Maintain contact with your teammates, such as going to the gym or training together to avoid secrecy and isolation. Work with strength and conditioning coaches and the sports nutritionists to follow training programs and meal plans. Allow your body to rest following an intense session or match. And if the athlete feels that they recognize symptoms of ED, that they are able to seek professional guidance and support from friends and family to help prevent symptoms worsening. There have been very few reports of players who have come out and admitted they suffer or had suffered from an eating disorder. Former Lioness Claire Rafferty spoke about dealing with an eating disorder and how isolated and alone she felt. Current Spurs defender Molly Bartrip wrote a hard-hitting article for the Players' Tribute, which will be linked below, discussing her own battle with ED. Former MLS goalkeeper Chris Seitz opened up on X, formerly Twitter, about body shaming in the men's game and how it led to him having an eating disorder. The stats indicate that there are more than these three individuals that are dealing with something like this. Are these unknown players getting the help they need? Obviously, this is a very difficult issue to disclose to the public, and I am not asking elite players to announce to the world that they are dealing with something like this. This is a mental disease that is all-consuming for the individual. So getting into recovery should be of utmost importance. If they choose to inform the public, then that is their choice. The fundamental reason I wanted to make this video is to shine light on something not discussed in elite football. Eating disorders in general are still very taboo in the public, which has an influence on opinions inside of football clubs. We are not privy to knowing what the players go through, and neither should we. 
As members of the public, we should be conscious that the men and women we watch on a weekly basis could be suffering with disordered eating. People don't realize that what we say can do a lot of harm to people who may already be vulnerable, and we should be very careful of what we say. This is not something only athletes deal with. There are millions of people in the UK and hundreds of thousands of people in Ireland fighting an eating disorder every day. People die every day from eating disorders because they are not diagnosed or treated in time. Not only is it a battle for the individual, but it's a fight for the family who feel helpless and vulnerable to the disease that is destroying somebody they love. It does not matter what gender you are, how old you are, how much money you have, or your place in the world. That voice telling you to engage in these behaviors is your loudest critic, preying on your vulnerability. Athletes are more prevalent to ED because of the competitiveness and the need for exercise. But this can range to anybody of any age playing for their local club to an elite superstar on the world stage. Although this is a hidden disease in the footballing landscape, it is affecting far more people than you can imagine. Awareness and education are crucial, especially for governing bodies. The topic of eating disorders is often neglected by government officials or head of organizations, despite eating disorders having one of the highest mortality rates of all mental illnesses. There are very few places one can go to seek treatment, and it is often only for those who can afford to get immediate help through private institutions. Many of those places have staff that are not trained in handling the multitude of ED patients, leading to people not getting the necessary help and ending up being left to their own demise. So please, if you or someone you know is showing signs of disordered eating, be there to support them. Let them know that you will be there to help them in their fight, because isolation feels like the only way to handle it. But keeping close to that person may be the difference in their journey to recover and return to the person that they were before this disease consumed their very being.